Soteriology part three. Um, so we've done a couple of weeks. We kind of spent a lot of time on uh, election, predestination, order of salvation, Calvinism, reform, doctrine, yada, yada, yada. Just talking about what it is. Uh, probably more time than I thought we would, but I hope it was beneficial. So we're going to move forward today. If you remember, we said the key question in general in soteriology is how can anyone be saved? Um, when we understand who God is and who we are, we see this seems like a bit of a, a difficult possibility, but we've talked a little bit about that. Now we're going we're gonna to move on in the next section to theories of atonement. So this is models or, I don't know if models is the right word, I guess theories is the word I put up there. So I say theories about how the atonement actually works. We're going to have a little bit of a a historical overview of some things because it's interesting to see um, where and when and in response to what certain theories of the atonement came up. Um, so, so for this particular kind of little mini session today, the key question is going to be different, and it is, what is salvation? So how can anyone be saved, given who God is and who we are? And, and when we say, okay, kind of said that must be possible. Now the question becomes, what is salvation? So to help us understand that, we're going to look at three key words and five theories of the atonement. So that's kind of your outline. Um, in some ways, the three key words will inform how we view those theories. Uh, and in some ways, not necessarily. So so I will, I will tell you, by the way, if you're expecting me to come down at the end and say, this is the right theory of atonement, you're in the wrong class. Because <laughs> I, as you know, I usually come down to the end and go, you know, there's a, there, there's a little bit in all of this yeah. that we can, we can learn from. Maybe, maybe we can't reduce something as incredible and miraculous as our salvation to a particular theory that came up in particular times. So three key words. Number one word we got to deal with, sin. Why? See, here, here's what we'll find when we get into the theories of atonement. Not all of them address sin, which seems surprising because, you know, modern day thoughts about what it means to be a Christian, what do we usually start with? Sin. Sin. Um, and it's an important concept. Uh, so, so to set the background, why I think this is important, I don't think you don't think it's important, so don't hear me say that. But, but to, before we get into who Jesus is and what he did and how that atonement has effect, sin as an as a idea, we need to understand, weaves its way and is somewhat a driving force of the entire Mosaic law. Why, why did God give the law? to identify what was sinful and what was not. And then in the law, because God knew that humanity was sinful, he outlines a very elaborate system, a sacrificial system, a priestly class of people. Um, on Sunday mornings in Hebrews, we've been talking a lot about this because that's kind of the Old Testament law is the basis for the argument of the book of Hebrews. So, so when we get to New Testament Jesus, we... And, and what he does, we have to understand all of this follows on the heels of the history of Israel. We can't just say, okay, the New Testament, we can forget all that. That doesn't matter. It matters a lot because it's, that's the background that comes forward with us. So when we talk about atonement, it seems like sin must be a pretty important thing because a lot of the law is concerned with outlining what is and what is not sin. And then saying, when you do sin, this is what you need to do to deal with it. So in God's character and nature, and in man's character and nature, there's, a, there's, inherent, there's an inherent conflict. That's a question about soteriology. How can anybody be saved if that's the case? And what is salvation? I think this key word is pretty important. God has, this has to have something to do with sin. Somewhere in there, sin has to factor in. Um, now, when I say some theories of the atonement don't deal with sin, I guess I mean, maybe better put, they don't address it directly. Or they define it in a way that I think, for me, it was like, oh, really? That's what that view of sin is. That's interesting. Um, so what is sin? We talked about this a while back. We looked at two words, uh, the Hebrew word and the Greek word. This is a guttural 
Hebrew reads from this way. So it's if you got a spit to say it's, it's like chata, and the Greek word is amartia. So both of these would be in the 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 Bible translated sin, and and this and these have in mind particularly this idea to miss the mark. You've probably heard that definition of sin before. Um, I like this verse. I will get where is sin in this is your assignment. Among all these soldiers, there were 700 select troops who were left handed, each of whom could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. This is the word sin. So this in our in a different like word for that, this is the word ta'a in Hebrew. They would not sin as we would say. So when we say miss the mark. Literally, so this is this is what we're getting at. So, so this is um not about sin and judgment and, and and everything. It's about, I guess you would say, military might. But it gives us an idea of that word for sin, how culturally it was understood um to miss the mark. So when we get over here to the New Testament, kind of the verse that we often talk about with sin, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We can see how this idea of missing the mark and this idea of falling short are, are parallel um, concepts that we all miss the mark. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. So sin in humanity that mars us from the fall has to do with something that is short of, or we might even go so far as to say opposed to the glory of God. His nature, character, one of the ways we define it. Why does the Bible, why did the Ten Commandments say, thou shalt not lie? Because in God's character and nature, he is truth. And anything that's a, not of God's character and nature, in this case a lie, is sin. Because it's a part, it misses the mark of God's holiness. Why should we not murder? Because God, I mean, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. God, God is the source of and the one who sustains all life. So anything that goes against life is against the character of God to take life when we have no right to do. So, so a lot of the moral law is bound up in, in this idea that out of the nature, the glory, the holiness of God, sin is anything that isn't found in the nature, the glory, the holiness of God, and it misses the mark or falls short of his glory. So when we're talking about the idea of atonement, we have to understand, we have to start with, well, maybe not start, we have to get this as kind of foundational, that sin plays a factor. Where there would be no sacrificial system, there would be no uh, temple, there'd be none of that, there'd be no day of atonement, none of the festivals, no Passover if it weren't for sin, and God needed to do something because humanity has fallen short, is, is acting in ways that are opposed to his character. And God's character, God's glory, God's holiness can't, can't abide that. And so sin has to factor in. It's a key word when we talk about theories of the atonement. What, how, what is salvation? We have to deal with this reality, that sin exists. I know I'm preaching to the choir, and you all know you're a bunch of lousy sinners, right? <laughs> I shouldn't say it that way. Actually, as believers, we're saints because we have been given a new identity in Christ. Now, we don't have our... Faces up, you know, in a temple around the corner, I think, <laughs> nonetheless. No, no, wait a minute. I just watched a show yesterday with Joe on Dante's Divine Comedy. Mm -hmm. It was the Nine Rings of the Church. And these were used as uh, how far you've fallen, just like you're talking. And uh, it's funny that you should bring that up the way you did because that's how it was presented. Show. Different, different levels of sin, um, but that's they use betrayal. Yeah, whatever the betrayal of God, the word ultimately is, sin is betrayal. Okay, something. I'm sorry, something, I didn't interrupt. Yeah, it's no, just, something in our character that betrays God's character. So yeah, it was an interesting show. So we're going to deal with atonement. We have to. We have to understand this is an issue. We're going to talk about salvation. This is the what do we need to be saved from. Um, now, you could also say the corollary that not just do we need to be saved from sin, but because of the glory of God, ultimately we need to be saved from God and his holiness in some ways. That God is opposed to us because of our sin, you might say. Maybe that makes you a little uncomfortable, but nonetheless, there it is. Second key word, 
sing the song with me, right? Let's sing Amazing Grace. No, we're not going to sing our songs. Grace. We're going to talk about theories of atonement. Yes, we have to talk about sin. And, and we need to understand that God's response to sin is ultimately grace. Now, if you remember, I'm going to go way back into the character of God. His communicable attributes, those that can be shared, one of them was justice. And remember, in, we drew the diagram, and we said there is justice, and there is injustice, right? Which would be the opposite of justice. But then there was this kind of gray area that we live in that we call non-justice. Non-justice does not go against the character of God like injustice does. But non-justice is what God extends to humanity rather than his justice that we, because of our sin, deserve. And grace falls in the category of non-justice. Not injustice, right? That's bad. That's sinful. That's wrong. But not justice. Mercy is another quality we would say is non-justice. Good things for us, but ultimately um, don't fall in the category of, you know, when we think of God, sometimes we throw those dichotomies out there. He's, he's perfectly just and can abide nothing that is not perfect justice. No, no, no. This, this isn't justice. This is not justice. It's not injustice, but it's not justice. So let's understand, we, we, we like this, right? The last thing we want to do is say, no, I want God to be absolutely just with me. Bad, bad news mm -hmm. all the way around. So grace falls in that. Let's talk about um, the Greek word charis, which a uh, bunch of definitions, a bunch of them. Um, I like this one, unmerited favor. There are different ways to put it. Uh, you might have heard some acrostics with grace. Uh, this is the one that I remember the most. God's riches at Christ's expense. Um, might have heard that. But, but unmerited favor it is one way to think about grace, meaning God grants us favor that we don't deserve. Again, it's not justice. It's, it's not the opposite of justice, which is injustice. It's just not just for God to grant us grace. But it's within his providence, within his will, within his character and nature to, to be able to grant grace. A few um, verses that give us this idea about favor. This word appears here, and the angel said to her, I know it's Easter, not Christmas, but why not bring up Christmas <laughs> verse? Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor. You have been graced by God. Is there anything about her that deserved God's favor? Well, if you're from a Catholic background, you say, yes, definitely. Um, and maybe uh, we Protestants shouldn't be quite so dismissive completely of Mary and how we, we, we kind of say no, kind of reactionary against the Catholic, Catholic, Catholic people. But just like any human, Mary finds herself in a place where God's favor is on her, his unmerited favor, his grace has been given to her. She doesn't deserve, she hasn't lived, you know, the doctrine of, is it, as I understand it, and maybe if there's a Catholic here, you can help me. Um, the Immaculate Conception has more to do with Mary's origin than Jesus is, that she had to somehow be the perfect vessel to be able to bear the, the Messiah. So I, I always thought Immaculate Conception was, you know, the, the virgin birth. But apparently it's more about Mary being somehow free from something, original sin or whatever, that allows her to be a worthy vessel to bear Jesus. I don't think that's what this means. But nonetheless, God acts in history through Jesus in ways that show there's favor, there's unmerited favor, there's grace lavished on us. Then we get to the book of Acts and we see the early church. And uh, it says, Chapter 4, with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was powerfully at work in them all. If I could put a, a, an epithet on a, on a church, is there a better one than that? God's grace is powerfully at work in them all. That would be my prayer for our church, that people, as, as we live together as the people of God and as our community experienced us, they would know God's grace was powerfully at work. Not anything about us, right? 
These apostles were unschooled, ordinary men, as they say when they see them. These, they, they don't have all the credentials. They're not the best and the brightest, necessarily. Uh, and yet, God's grace is at work in them. I think a little bit later when it talks about, I think, chapter 11, the church at Antioch, that, that's one of the defining uh, descriptors of Antioch as well, that in God's grace was was present or, or, or at work among them. But, but there's something about that. Again, God's favor. The, the reality of this is, when we think about his unmerited favor, now, now obviously we're talking bigger than just salvation, right? This, this is people who are saved, but this isn't a salvation verse. Mary is not a salvation. She wasn't saved because God's favor was on her. And the, the church, you know, this isn't about salvation, even though grace ties into the idea of atonement and salvation. Um, but grace being this reality that God works in remarkable ways that certainly we don't merit. There's nothing meritorious about us that allows God to do that, just chooses to do that through those of us who submit ourselves to him. And he did that in the early church. So, so we have to talk about sin. And one of, one of the ways God responds to sin is through grace. And then the third word is faith. I have to do this, I'll go to the verse first, because of Ephesians 2, 8, 9, right? For it's by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, and the gift of God, not by works, so no one boasts. We know that verse pretty well, but, but faith itself is the word pistis in, in Greek, and um, usually we think this middle word, faith means belief. It's probably the, the, the worst of these three words, and the worst possible translation, if you just believe, it's fine. No, it's it's belief that has a better foundation than just what I want to happen or what I wish was true. You know, little kids believe in Santa Claus. Is it okay to say it? It's fine. Um, and they believe, I remember when Caroline learned there was no Santa Claus. She bawled and bawled and bawled. Um, she, was, she couldn't, uh, she was heartbroken. Um, you know, so so obviously she might have had this simple and pure belief in this that we told her and and, and kind of talked about at Christmas, but but it's more than that in in, in this idea, particularly of salvation. Um, it, it's conviction, it's trust, it's it's belief that demonstrates itself through action. Faith implies action. It's this conflict imagined. In the Protestant Reformation, I say imagine, they don't say imagine, between Paul and James. You read Paul's writings, and he's all about faith, right? Just, just like this, you know, it's by grace through faith, not of yourselves. There's nothing you can do. It's a gift of God. It's, it's grace through faith. It's not by works. And then you get to James, and what does James say? Faith without works is dead. This is, this is another one of those both ends. Paul is right. James is right. You know. Your faith, then just, oh, I believe that. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't result in any change, any action. It's not really faith. It's it's wishful thinking. Um, I think this is the King James, not the NIV. I like the translation of the New King James. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We just went through Hebrews 11 and talked at length on Sunday mornings about some of the things here. But, but this idea... Faith is substance. It's not, I'm, not, I'm trying to think. Faith, uh, one translation that I memorized was faith is being sure of what you hope for, certain of what you do not see. Now, it's a translation. I don't know if it's NIV or another one. But, but I, I, I think it empties. The, the word substance for me is, well, should I say more substantive than just being sure of what you hope for? Really, really want a bike for Christmas. Oh, look, I got a bike for Christmas. I had faith. No, no, this God saving faith, God kind of faith is not that. It's not wishful thinking. Um, and it plays a part in when we think about what is salvation and these views of the atonement we'll get into in just a minute. It plays a key part in understanding, I would say, our response to the reality that our sin can be graced by God in a way that brings forgiveness. Um, so we have kind of the, the person of God and the reality of humanity. We have to think about sin. 
God, in response to sin, his response is grace. And then our response to the grace of God is faith. It's kind of how I see these three ideas interplay in the idea of salvation. So let's get to theories of the atonement. I made some notes because I wanted to talk historically. Now, somewhat, depending on how you view these theories, I'm trying to go in quasi-chronological order. I'm not sure if this first one is as old as it's purported to be, because the definitive work on the first one came out in the 1800s. Um, but that work said this view of the atonement dates back that we misunderstood the early church and the early church fathers, and this is what they really believed. And it's called this. It's called Christus Victor, Christ the Victor. Um, this is a theory of atonement. Now, if we're talking about uh, those those ideas, sin, grace, and faith, sin doesn't play much a part in here because in Christus Victor. There's no debt in vision that we owe God that has to be paid. Rather, it's, it's more like a rescue mission that God embarks on by sending Jesus because we have been captured. We have become enslaved to sin. So you can look at the Passover story. Moses coming back, deliverer of the people of Israel, Jesus being a new Moses. It's a very big theme, and, and particularly Matthew's gospel, Jesus is the new Moses. Um, so you can see how that would be. He's, he's the one that comes back, and he's the deliverer from bondage, playing on that. Um, but, you know, basically we think about the powers that we're in bondage to. It would be the big three, sin, death, and the devil, or hell. Sin, death, and hell, right? That, that we are, because of our, our you know, we would say because of our sin, this doesn't really understand sin as a debt that Jesus comes to pay. Rather, this is a cosmic battle that Jesus comes to fight, to liberate us from the forces of evil that hold us hostage and enslaved. So Christ is the victor. Um, we see this Psalm 110. We've read this a lot. The most quoted psalm in the New Testament, Psalm 110, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So the idea is that Christ, as the victor, is seated at the right hand of the Father and his enemies have been subdued. And so as the to the victor go the spoils is kind of the idea that some see in, in this, this view um, goes right back to, to the first pages of scriptures of the fall. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and he will strike his heel. So the idea is we reach back that yes, the, at the fall, humanity became enslaved to the devil and this eternal conflict between good and evil, between God and, and, and the adversary began and Christ comes ultimately to crush the head of the serpent to win the victory, to free us from slavery, um, Hebrews chapter 2. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death we might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil. So those, those big three, sin, death, hell, uh, that, that hold power over humanity because of our rebellion in the garden that leads to our captivity to, to say, so sin plays a, a role, it's what caused our captivity but Jesus is coming Jesus's death and resurrection isn't envisioned as any sort of payment for sin it's envisioned rather as a victory over our enslavement to the devil and you can see this by what we're told in, in Revelation 1 that he holds the keys in addition John has Revelation 1 18 he holds the keys to death and to hell that seems pretty like I, I won this is mine or, or 1 Corinthians 15, and we'll talk about that probably in a week and a half on Easter Sunday. And, and it talks about where, O oh, death, is your sting. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God that he gives us the victory through Christ Jesus our Lord. So, so all of these ideas are bound up in this. Um, so so you, you, you see, sin is kind of not as important. It's there that caused the problem. Grace and faith are hard to find because in this view, my when, when I think about faith particularly, 
Um, if Jesus has come and defeated the devil, who is liberated? I think the dangerous implication means a kind of a universalism it is, is a danger of this view, that since he has defeated the devil and he owns the keys to, to death and hell, that there's nobody in there. Everybody gets to be saved. He's won the battle. The battle's over. You know, it takes away some of, we might say, the personal responsibility in this, that Jesus comes. And, and in freeing us from that, again, potentially, I'm not saying this is the way that it's often presented, but there is that danger that that's where it could go. If Jesus has won the victory, and sin as a offense against God or as a debt is not a problem once the victory is won, you know, like if we were in, let's go first century uh, Israel, we were in Judea and Rome comes in and conquers Judea, even though before we were Greek subjects, now we're what? We're all Roman subjects and Caesar is the winner. So we're all part of Caesar's people now. So if we were enslaved to sin and Jesus Christ's victor comes in and wins, now aren't we all just his people? So that could be a little bit of, a, I think, a weakness in this idea. So, so the, the, the proponents would say this is actually the oldest view of the atonement. I'm not so sure. Um, because, again, it was the late 1800s, if you want to know, Gustav Allen wrote the book that outlined kind of the definitive work on the Christus Victor uh, theory of the atonement and tried to connect it to the early church fathers. And the, the idea is there. And I, was, I, I told you I'm like on social media in preacher world, which is a weird place. Church world, weird. Preacher world, social media is really weird. Just going to say. Uh, and so lately, like this one has been thrown out by certain people um, that are, are trying to say, this is the oldest one. The last one we get to is kind of being denigrated as, as this is the real one and that one's the, I mean, it's just interesting. Um, so I think lately as that's risen, I've read more about it, seen more it, it kind of put out there. Um, people are trying to say it's really old and really original. I'm not so sure, but I put it first. Mostly because I don't like it and we get past it. <laughs> not that there's not truth in it, right? There, there's, a, there's truth in it. Yeah. I'm not denying. I mean, we read several scriptures and we mentioned several more that talk about the victory that Christ won. But I just don't know if it, it's in any way close to a complete picture of what happens. I don't think it deals with the big three issues in an adequate way. Um, the next one is called the ransom theory. So this is origin in the 200s. Now, the name Origin, I don't mean it's the origin. I mean, the, the guy that came up with it. His name is actually Origin. He was an early church theologian in the 200s AD. So we're going way back, right? We're going to talk way back. This goes way back. Um, and uh, Augustine of Hippo, St. Augustine, or depending on how you want to pronounce it, was another potential proponent of this a little bit later. Um, you can see by the name that there, there's a similarity here. Uh, and this one, um, you know, we're, we're held captive and need to be freed. And this one, we're held captive, but a ransom is due. There's a payment that needs. So a little bit of the debt idea comes in. Some sort of payment needs to be made. Um, so, so we see some verses like this. Jesus said, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Um, so... Um, there you go. There's the word in relation to what Jesus came to do. First Timothy 2, for there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. Again, and then, then we can think about it. This is one of the places particularly that, for me, um, is interesting and comes up in, in some of what Origen writes, the temptations of Jesus. The, the one where Satan takes him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor and said, all this I will give you if you will bow down and worship me. Now, what, what is Jesus's response? I don't have that on the screen, but you might know this. What's Jesus's response? He gives him the finger. No, not exactly. This is, um, you should only worship the Lord your God. Lord your God, right? Notice what he doesn't say. He and, and this is part of the reasoning. 
Jesus never says to Satan, it's not yours to give. As if the implication is Satan was making a legitimate offer that he actually did have all the kingdoms of the world at his hands and could have given them to Jesus. I think it, it, it's, it's a stretch, but we do know that there are places in scripture that say that, that he's the prince of this world. And, and you know, there's, there's much of that sin enters the world and there seems to be a dominion of, of Satan. Our, our battle and spiritual warfare is not against flesh and blood. And then it lists, you know, powers and principalities, this sort of rank of demonic forces that have some authority in this world. Um, so, so I can see where that has some ring of truth. Ultimately, I would say God is sovereign in whatever Satan, claim Satan had was. Yeah. Had. So Satan was just an angel and a fallen angel. And so Christ would be above of him, correct? Sure. And Jesus so, is God. How can he offer to God's hand? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, so ultimately, that's what I say that that while Satan may have had some claim because of sin to this created order, God had released His ultimate claim as the sovereign Lord over all creation to completely to Satan, but allowed him, we might say, the the freedom, for lack of a better word, to wreak all the havoc he continues to wreak. And, and part of the the negative about this. Ransom theory is in its original um, presentation. The ransom isn't owed to God, isn't owed to God, but the ransom is owed to Satan because he owns it all. So Jesus had to pay the ransom price, not to God because our sin had defended a holy God, but to Satan, who was the rightful ruler, keeper, whatever of us based on our sin. And when he pays the ransom, um, well, then we are freed from that obligation or that debt or whatever we'd like to say to Satan. Now, now you can see there I would be like, eh, I don't know that that's, that, that the problem my sin caused and the debt I owe is necessarily to God. Now later it said um, rather than Satan, those who got uncomfortable with that said it was actually to death itself that the ransom was, was owed. So death had to be ransomed so that life could live in us. Maybe it's a little better but ultimately that seems kind of, it falls a little short, um, as particularly the object of the ransom. You know, to me, when we talk about sin, grace, and faith, those are, are very much God-directed. Uh, my sin causes an offense to God. Satan is not offended by my sin. <laughs> he's pretty happy with it <laughs> most of the time. And and as long as I'm doing it, he's thrilled, right? But God is, is offended, and so the grace that needs to be granted, that non-justice that is allowed me, uh, comes from God, not from Satan. Like Satan's like, okay, if you pay me enough, you can have the creation back. I don't, I don't know that. You know, just thinking of it that way, what, what would it take for, for him? And then you could say, okay, well, it took the death of Jesus. Uh, okay, yes, if he knows who Jesus is because he's a fallen angel and he understands the Trinity, maybe that seems like a pretty big price. You know, this is this would be like the uh uh mind which in the wardrobe would fit into sort of this view of the atonement where the white witch takes Oslin's life instead of um, Edmund's life in, in that book, right? So interesting, popular early, but I don't know if I'm 100% comfortable. Um, so we got to go to number three, the satisfaction theory of the atonement. Uh, no, this was not brought up by the Rolling Stones, in case you're wondering. <laughs> This is Anselm of Canterbury, is our friend, in the uh, around a thousand, between a thousand and eleven hundred. Um, interesting, uh, very popular theory of the atonement. Um, at the time it came out, it was well agreed to by large swaths of the church. Remember, at this point, we're still one holy Catholic church. We haven't had the Protestant Reformation yet. So he's Anselm of Canterbury. We're talking a key figure in a key place in history. And um, the idea is that, well, for him, sin is nothing else than to not render to God his due. And the, the key concept behind that is honor. Human sin defrauds God of the honor he is due, which is, I can understand a little bit of that, right? I can say, when I sin, 
Rather than honoring God, honoring his holiness, honoring his word, I've chosen to dishonor him by going with my own pride, my own desire, whatever. So, so I, I, can, I can get that, um, but I, I'm not quite ready to say sin is simply dishonor. Um, it seems to be a little more than that. And uh, satisfaction, in Anselm's view, is not punishment. It's the alternative to punishment. Christ satisfied our debt of honor due God by, by his honorable sinless life and, and death so that we can avoid the punishment that is due us for our dishonor. So, so we see satisfaction um, in that sense has a lot to do with honor. Now, now the, interesting, the other interesting thing about this view is in Anselm's book, there's not a lot of scripture. Most of you would think if you read theology books, you're going to get cross-references and passages and all. Uh, Anselm is really light on Scripture. It's, a, it's more logic. It's given where he is in history. Maybe that makes sense. Uh, but if we're going to look at uh, a scriptural basis, he likes Isaiah 53, the suffering servant passage. He was oppressed and affliction, afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and the sheep before his shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. So you can see, you see a, a undercurrent of the idea of the honor, the honorable death that Jesus was willing to die for us. John 10, 18, um, we see here uh, another verse that's key in Anselm. It, there's not much to go from in Anselm's scriptural basis. These are two of the the easiest to connect. No one takes my life from me, Jesus says, I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down and the authority to take it up in the, this command I received from my father. So his honorable life and death, see so Isaiah 53, John 10, 18, um, it somehow satisfies God in a way that allows us to escape his punishment. So a lot of these theories so far have been major on what Christ has done on our behalf. But I think there's also the, the for, for both of these, for all three of these, Christus, Victor, Ransom, Satisfaction, the open-endedness of universalism is possible. If Christ, where, where's faith? Where's the human response or responsibility in any of this? These three, in my opinion, go light on that. Um, and, and even somewhat grace, which seems to be a pretty important Bible word and salvation word that, that describes who God is and what he's done. These three really aren't heavy on that. It, it understands some offense, some ransom uh, up there that needs to be that needs to be dealt with, i.e. the sin. But it sees Christ as stepping in and and acting, not necessarily, and maybe you can see that as the grace of God sending Christ in some way, but but those I that idea in a, in a well codified, articulated way isn't really key in, in these three. Now, does that mean there's no value in any of these? No, so don't hear me saying that. Um, there there are some things we can glean, but I think the that they just kind of for me fall short. I guess I will say I do have my favorite. <laughs> even though it's not the only one. Number four, I, I said this is my least favorite. This is actually my least favorite um, of all of them. It's called the moral example theory of the atonement. It's in 11, 1100, 1200. So it's in direct response to Anselm and the satisfaction theory um, that somehow it's not about satisfying God's honor, but it was supposed to, if, if the satisfaction theory focuses on God's honor has been besmirched and by our sin it needs to be done, the moral example theory says that's not the problem. Instead, Jesus wanted to demonstrate the love of God in such a compelling way that people would be drawn to him. And so he lit, which, which is you know kind of that, instead of maybe sin and dishonor, we're, we're doing love and and maybe more on the grace side a little bit there. Um, Jesus' death, I'll just read this that, that, that I found, was to influence mankind toward moral improvement. 
Okay, salvation is not moral improvement. Let's just say that. <laughs> it's not just acting nicer, right? Jesus' death was designed to greatly impress mankind with a sense of God's love, resulting in softening their hearts and leading them to repentance. So it's heavy on God's love as the demonstrative aspect of the atonement that would be that which would draw people to God. Now, is there an example that Christ gave? Follow God's example. Therefore, as dearly loved children, walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself us up for us as a fragrant offering. So yes, does Jesus set a wonderful moral example? Yes. Does he demonstrate the love of God? Absolutely. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. There we go. This is how we know what it is. Jesus Christ, or Romans 5.8. I think that in here now. Um, God demonstrated his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. So moral example as an aspect of who Jesus is and what he did and the concept that his love demonstrated by the cross could be a compelling draw to humanity to say, if God loved me enough to do that, maybe I should consider him. Yeah. But as a complete theory of this is what atonement is, it really seems to lack. Last one. Probably the, it's the most recent of these. This is um, uh, the Reformation. Penal substitutionary. Now, we could just leave that out and say uh, the substitutionary view of the atonement is, is a view. But particularly out of the, um, the Reformation comes this idea that it's not just Jesus as our substitute, it's Jesus as the substitute paying the penalty, penal, like the penal system, judge, judge jails and whatnot. Um, and so this is Luther, this is Calvin, this is response to, uh, in the Reformation, the abuses and indulgences of the Catholic Church um, that, in their mind, writ large, the failings of mankind and and brought to the to the core to the fore um, their desire. So I think if I was going to describe my view of the atonement, it would most directly line up with this, but it has elements of all of them, right? Did Christ win a victory? Was there a ransom? Do we see that? Was there satisfaction needed? Was the love of God compelling to the sacrifice of Christ? Yes. So, so here's, again, what I've said all along as we get to the It's like, pick one, only one. No, can't make, um, I want to pick all of them and put them together because the weakness of theology sometimes is the lines that we draw and the choices that seem to be forced to make. Um, Galatians 3.13 Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole or hangs on a tree, the cross, obviously, in mind there. Um, curses and blessings are huge in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 28, we can hit this drum because I think it's fascinating. Uh, what they Remember when they go into the promised land, what they do, they have two mountains, I think it's Ebal and Gilead, maybe I'm wrong. And on one of them, they set up a monument with the blessings and on the other one they have curses and they put priests on each of them and they have this huge ceremony as they go in where the curses are said and the blessings are said and you read deuteronomy 28 it's like 14 verses of blessings and a thousand fifty verses of curses it's really weighted heavily the wrong way uh, because the law that was given is overwhelming we, we can't keep it and we're under the curse of the law um, how does, at, at the fall, when we think about um, Adam and Eve's sin, what happens, the next section, we usually call that the curse of the fall. So right, chapter three, after after paradise, we have the curse. We have the curse of the fall, the curse of the law, he goes, Ryan, where we, we, did, we went one more, and that's a sermon. <laughs> think on that, Steve, that's true. We'll do that. So um, Jesus comes, and he becomes the curse for us. This is out of Deuteronomy, I believe. Uh, becomes the curse, hanging on the cross for us. So you see the idea that, that he's our substitute, becoming for us what we couldn't do on our own. Um, Romans 6.23, when I talk to particularly teens 
and kids about salvation, this is usually the verse I use because I think it is easy to understand and, and shows a huge contrast. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So I usually explain this way. What you deserve, what you get paid for the job that you've been doing of sin is to be separated from God forever. But instead of wages, you're given a gift, not sin, but it's perfect from God and not death, but life. And how do you get it? through or in Jesus Christ our Lord. I think it's a great verse that summarizes a lot of the gospel and, and shows us that, hey, God, Jesus did something for us. We owe the debt. He pays the debt on our behalf, and we get a gift. Um, for it is impossible, Hebrews, for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. So, so here's the thing, that Old Testament law and sacrificial system the writer of Hebrews says to people who believed in it, you know better. It didn't work. It's not effective. We need a better way. And that's where Jesus comes in. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Last one, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Uh, this one particularly, you can see it. Um, the sinless Jesus who becomes sin for us. He bears on himself our sins. So you can see the substitutionary aspect, the penalty that he pays as well. Is that the last slide? So let's go back to this. So if we're, if we're using our three words, sin, grace, and faith, this is your homework. <laughs> Give them a score, one to five. Which one is... It does the best job with sin. Which one does the best job with grace? Which one does the best job with faith? Um, not that that's the only way to rate theories of the atonement, but as we think about that, we can see how that can inform our view. I mean, if the question is, what is salvation? Which is where we start, which is why we want to deal with sin, grace, and faith. Is salvation the fact that Christ has won a victory for us? You say, yes. Is salvation the fact that there was a ransom owed that Christ by his death made? You say, yes. Is salvation satisfying something in the nature and character of God that our sin has not? Yes. Is, is salvation Jesus demonstrating the excellency of God's love? Yes. Is salvation Jesus taking our place, paying the penalty so that we wouldn't have to? Yes, these aren't the only theories. There are more. They're the five I picked because I figured that's as much as I wanted that you could stand. <laughs> Maybe a little bit of both. Um, but I picked them secondly because it kind of gives us a bit of a sweep through history. This is, I would suggest, the predominant Protestant view today. I think... Um, if I was going to, you know, like I said, there's some things in these that seem to have weaknesses, universalism or whatever. Um, you know, this idea for some people seems to be offensive. That, And it's usually put this way. God had to punish his son, had to kill his son, so you could go to heaven. What kind of God is that? You know, put it that harshly. Um, I don't think that's a proper understanding of this view of the atonement, but like most things in our day, we have to reduce it to it's the absurd to make a point to illustrate um, why we're right and you're wrong. And that's kind of the, the, the reality we face, but nonetheless, um, it is the predominant one. It is not without criticism, um, but of them all, I think it does the most justice to sin, grace, and faith. As far as sin requires a penalty and demands a substitute, the grace of God allows him to be that substitute, and the faith part of that is my response, receiving that gift, gift of God's eternal life through and in Jesus Christ our Lord. So that's that's the theories of the atonement. That's soteriology. That's the end of my notes and your attention span, maybe too. <laughs> What do you got? Any co thoughts, comments, questions? I somehow missed what the key question was of the theories of time. What is salvation? What is salvation? 
Well, this is fine for keeps. This is our soul that Jesus has yep. painfully substituted for. And, and so way above my pay grade. I know you're just like, can I just say thank you, Jesus? It's, it's, so, so, it's, it's so forever. It's, it's so hard. Wow. Can be. Well, well, well presented. Thank you. Theologians are famous for taking the simple and making it complex. <laughs> <laughs> when they think they're taking the complicated and making it simple. <laughs> so, anyway. All right. I will pray and let you be. Enjoy the rest of your week. Father in heaven, we thank you for what you have done for us through Jesus. Lord, we acknowledge and recognize that without his gift of life and death and resurrection, without the salvation that comes through him, we are lost and without hope in this world. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. We are separated from you, not just in this life, but for eternity. And we thank you that out of your great love, that you demonstrated it by his, his gift of, of his death, dying while we were yet sinners. Lord, thank you for the gift of your spirit who calls us to yourself. And thank you for the response of faith that allows us to take what you have done and make it personal, make it real for us. Lord, I thank you for the fellowship we have, the camaraderie we have as your church. And may, may we never take for granted the lengths to which you have gone to secure for us the blessings of salvation. So great is salvation, even as the writer of Hebrews would remind us. So bless us this evening. Bless us as we leave this place and go to our homes, as we enter the rest of this week and whatever it may hold. May you use us, we pray, for your kingdom and for your glory. In Jesus' name.